Hello and welcome to this 30-minute uh, seminar um, from the cardiology team. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more practical um, topics and I hope you will like it. We're going to start discussing murmur investigation and characteristics of the murmur, but also how they can help us determine which tests can we use after we uh, recognize that there is a murmur. And this is me, Ilaria Spada. First of all, we need to know what is a murmur. And we know that murmurs can be defined as simply just turbulent blood flow. Um, dogs and cats just have two heart sounds that we normally auscultate, so S1 and S2, and you can see it here, S1 and then S2, and murmurs tend to occur mostly during the study, so between S1 and S2, and here you can see, um, you know, a diagram depicting one systolic murmur. Um, and they can, you know, they can occur also during diastole. They can have some murmur characteristics that are not simply systolic or diastolic. We will just go into review that um, shortly. Um, but we need to remember another important thing. That is, we think about turbulent blood flow and we, you know, associate that with um, pathological heart disease in terms of murmur, valvular insufficiency or regurgitation. However, we have to remember that there are other uh, conditions that can alter blood viscosity or that can change, you know, LV ejection. And therefore, not all murmurs have to be associated with heart disease. And I think that is very important because when we are evaluating, you know, for example, an anemic patient or a dog with pyrexia or fever, or we have a very fit athletic dog, maybe a narrow chested one, um, we may, in fact, detect very soft murmurs that may not necessarily be associated with underlying structural heart disease. Um, so we need to bear this in mind when we evaluate our patients. And this comes alongside with murmur characterization, because of course we can hear murmur, but then we need to try to look up for a little bit more details because that can help us um, to, to determine what could we do next. So what do we need, first of all, to collect as part of uh, the information we need to provide to ourselves and to our differentials when we auscultate a murmur? Definitely an anatomical location, so where is the murmur? And if it irradiates somewhere, the timing, so systolic or diastolic, for example, the intensity of the murmur, and the pitch and quality, which is something we don't tend to do, you know, most of the time. Um, but these are things that we should be collecting each time we auscultate a patient. And so you should read a little bit like that. So we have a dog with a grade four out of six holosystolic high frequency plateau murmur with point of maximal intensity at the left apex irradiating to the right hemithorax. Okay, a lot of information, right? So what would be the minimal information that we would try and strive to obtain when we auscultate, you know, our patient? Definitely anatomical location. And in timing, it's important, of course, and intensity. These are at least the minimal data set we need to try to collect for each of our patients, which is, you know, it may not be as easy, but it definitely is possible in 95% of our patients. Let's try. And that should read a little bit like that. A grade four out of six holocystotic murmur with point of maximum intensity at the left apex or a left apical grade for four out of six whole systolic murmur. Um, when we discuss about murmur characteristics, we should probably uh, you know, pay attention to the anatomical location. And we know that there are at least three areas of the um, of the left chest and the right and one area on the right chest where we can auscultate, but the point of maximum intensity can be further reduced into a left basilar, a left apical, and a right murmur. And then there are situations where the murmur is not basilar, is not apical, is not on the right. It may be, you know, 
cranial to the left base, which is, for example, typical for patent of arteriosus murmurs, um, or it can be sternal, like we see sometimes in cats, because cats, you know, are very tiny creatures most of the time, unless we're dealing with, you know, a Maine Coon or a Norwegian forest cat, but they have small chests and then they have small hearts. And the typical murmur that we hear when we have dynamic left ventricular outflow tread obstruction um, in, in cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that can be heard best on the sternum so it's not even right or left you just like have to swing your um stethoscope from one side to the other side and probably you will hear it loudest at the sternum um and that is because you know we have small chest but also for the location of the murmur we then have to consider intensity and you know just to recap we generally use a six level scheme which is the standard one that we always uh, refer to so one two three four five out of six and six out of six with uh, you know uh, um, it's a crescent uh, severity or intensity scheme so from one which is a softer to six which is a thrilling very loud murmur and it's associated with uh, a precordial thrill um, and that is generally the way we you know grade murmurs However, if we consider the practicality of the clinical impact of these murmurs, um, a four-level scheme has been proposed and you know, validated in different disease conditions. And it basically um, aims at getting a little bit more of a characteristic characterization in terms of the intensity. So we can uh, couple grade one and two into a soft murmur. Um, a moderate murmur, which is a three out of six, and then we have a loud murmur, four out of six, and then for five and, and six out of six, where a precordial thrill is needed to, you know, to grade five or six, you can definitely, you know, go on and say, well, it's a palpable murmur. Um, this has been used um, in, in, in different studies, and I'll show you later on. Um, another way of characterizing the murmur is the timing, as we were saying, uh, which is, you know, more in a simplistic way, it's systolic, diastolic. But then if we think about systolic, we should try to pay attention about the length of this murmur. Is it is the murmur audible all throughout systole? Well, then we can talk about a whole systolic murmur. Some uh, cardiologists will go with, oh no, it's a pan-systolic if you even have a all throughout systole murmur, but then even S1 and S2 cannot be aud uh, clearly aud um, auscultated, and that is called pan-systolic by some. Um, and then there are situations where the murmur cannot be heard all throughout systole, but only during a specific time. So at the beginning of systole, and you can call it proto-systolic or early systolic, mid or end of systole. The same applies to diastolic murmurs, so you can talk about hollow diastolic, um, early diastolic, mid-diastolic, mid etc. And then there are situations where you have literally two murmurs from the same disease condition. Let's say, for example, a pulmonic stenosis. You have the typical systolic, hollow systolic murmur of, of you know, a pulmonic stenosis causing um, you know, narrowing and turbulent blood flow throughout the valve. But then there is a little bit of a flat black backlash, a backflash of, of blood causing pulmonic regurgitation. And that is diastolic. So you can have two murmurs with a pause between the two, and that call, that's called a to and fro murmur. And then the most typical and pathognomonic murmur for a patent ductus arteriosus is a continuous murmur. So it's not systolic, it's not diastolic, it's all throughout the cardiac cycle. And there is no pause in between. So I discuss very briefly murmur characteristics and there is a point in that. The point is being that some murmurs characteristics can help us determine in a likelihood fashion if we're dealing with an innocent or physiological murmur 
Uh, but also the memory intensity is one of the criteria that we can try to apply in a more in a very generalistic way about the need of treatment, the severity of the condition. So let's see a little bit more about that. Memory characteristics um, that are likely associated with innocent or physiological memories are these ones uh, summarized in the table. So we have a change in memory intensity between rest and exercise with rest um, showing a softer murmur. The grade and the intensity of the murmur is always soft to moderate. It's never higher than three out of six. And the timing is important because it doesn't last the whole systole. So it's a mid systolic, early systolic, or even late systolic in some situation, but it's not holosystolic. If you hear a holosystolic murmur, then it's not a physiological murmur. The localization of these murmurs tend to occur at the left heart base. There is no way there is the irradiation of this murmur because it's an innocent and physiological murmur. And there are no other auscultation abnormalities such as, you know, systolic clicks, gallops, um, that shouldn't be uh, present if we think about an innocent murmur. So it's already, uh, you know, if we hear, you know, early systolic, great two out of six heart murmur, uh, that is located with point of maximum intensity at the left heart base, then we should be thinking maybe this dog may have an innocent murmur. And as I said to you before, murmur intensity is important when we evaluate disease severity because there are um, a couple of studies that investigated murmur intensity and the severity of disease condition. And they show that indeed, um, if we have a soft murmur, most of the times we do not expect to see uh, severe heart disease. Um, and that has been studied both in congenital, so pulmonic and subaortic stenosis cases, but also in dogs with mitral valve disease. Um, and even the, uh, when we evaluate, you know, dogs with degenerative mitral valvular disease, mitral valve disease, which is, you know, the most common probably uh, heart disease in dogs, even if we think about, um, you know, a study that included a 6,000 dogs, murmur intensity, heart rate during a physical examination and radiographic vertebral heart um, scale were all positively associated with staging B2, B1 um, or C. So um, the softer the murmur, the more likely we are dealing with, you know, an early stage disease. And murmur intensity is also important when we evaluate treatment. Because if we think about the EPIC trial, which is, um, you know, a double-blind placebo-controlled study in dogs with preclinical degenerative mitral valve disease and already echocardiographic signs of cardiac remodeling, one of the inclusion criteria for dogs to be included in this um, uh, trial was a heart murmur of moderate to high intensity, so greater, equal or greater than three out of six meaning that if you hear two out of six heart murmur, uh, it's unlikely that dog will need treatment. Okay, so that is very important. What is though a limiting factor? Because, you know, we all, we have discussed all these very important things and, um, you know, careful consideration when we auscultate a dog, but then there are some limiting factors um, relying on relying only on murmur characteristics. And the big two is that, you know, we need time, experience, you know, to level up our um, understanding and auscultatory capacities, because it's not something that you, you know, you are born with that. You just need to practice and practice. So there is a learning curve. And more recently, now that we, you know, we all, or most of us have access to additional imaging, then auscultation is just, you know, can be felt as, you know, one step before we just do additional diagnostics. But then it, it, it's not really 100% true. Um, murmur auscultation, auscultation and, you know, characterization of um, all these murmurs and heart sounds are important and they can provide additional information. We're not used to, uh, you know, stop and think too much about that. 
And there is another limitation. The limitation is that although it's an objective study, uh, in an objective way of quantifying murmurs, because we try, you know, with grading intensity, localizing the murmur, defining timing, it is still subjective because there may be some differences between um, murmur characterization in between people. And a study from Stavir, Van Staver uh, um, et al. Um, that was published actually showed that, that if you compare a cardiologist, a general practitioner and a final year student, you will see that there might be some discrepancies in picking up a murmur and characterizing the murmur. So that is important because we need to invest time on that. And the more we do it, the more we can probably learn. Um, but we need another important thing that is a quiet environment and a compliant patient, which is probably not always the case in clinical practice. And, and these can be limiting factors. You can miss murmurs because you know you have a very loud um, environment and you have people talking at you while you're listening to the dog, and the dog is wriggly, and you know. Um, these are limiting factors and so it is difficult sometimes and these days to say okay so um, I'm just going to you know stick with murmur auscultation and that's it make my decisions just based on that and we have to acknowledge that but we have to try to get the most that we can already from auscultation to just try to you know prioritize and think okay so what could could it be this murmur what what can we do next um, and when we think about what can we do next, I think um, when we, you know, think about cardiology, there are a list of, you know, diagnostics that we can um, evaluate. And first of all, it's ECG, which is definitely very important when we have a dog that has an arrhythmia on auscultation, and it's important that we, you know, we offer that if we hear an arrhythmia. Uh, and it's diagnostic when we discuss arrhythmia characterization. However, when we think about the ECG being the next diagnostic steps in a dog with a murmur, we have to remember that there is very low sensitivity and possibly a little bit better specificity if we have a dog with a murmur and we just run an ECG. The low sensitivity being that, you know, we may have a normal ECG, but that doesn't tell us, does, that doesn't rule out heart disease. Um, if we have an abnormal ECG, so we have, you know, chamber enlargement, for example, then we may say, okay, there can be something there that we need to investigate further, but it doesn't provide a final diagnosis and it doesn't tell us what the disease is. So it's very limiting um, to rely only on ECG if we have a heart murmur. There are studies that um, assess that. So here is a little bit of a short um, summary of those. Um, what about thoracic radiographs? Well, that is very um, different from ECG because it's diagnostic when it comes to dogs that have a heart murmur and we find cardiomegaly because we indeed find that there is heart disease. Uh, and the degree and, and location of the cardiomegaly can help us you narrow down our differentials. Uh, however, normal radiographs does not do not do not tell us do not do, do not fully rule out heart disease, and that is true most most important when we think about that in dogs with um, large breed dogs or dogs where we suspect preclinical DCM because they may have in fact normal thoracic radiographs but they do have systolic dysfunction. Um, and cats, because to see cardiomegaly in a cat, you need to have significant remodeling in there. So um, a normal radiograph in some scenarios, they, they are not very you know, sensitive in uh, detecting heart disease. Um, but they are very helpful when we see cardiomegaly because, as I said, we can narrow down the differentials. You know, for example, if we see, you know, a big left atrium and a big left, left ventricle and we have a small breed dog, then, you know, we can be comfortable in saying, well, the most likely diagnosis is degenerative mitral valve disease. Um, and for example, even in dogs with pulmonary hypertension that come to us very tachypnic, then if we see a pulmonary artery bulge on, on thoracic radiographs, 
alongside some uh, lung and vascular changes, then we can say, well, it could be possible that we're dealing with that. Um, and so they're very helpful when we have a, a dog or a cat with clinical signs because we can then say, okay, it's congestive heart failure, we need to treat that, for example. Echocardiogram is probably, um, you know, the most important, helpful and diagnostic test of all of this. Uh, it's our gold standard. As a cardiologist, we always rely on that very heavily. It's very important because with one single test, we can rule in or rule out heart disease if, if we hear a murmur. Uh, with a near certainty, I guess we can never provide full certainty, but I would probably say that in 98% of the cases we get a final diagnosis, whether there is or there isn't um, a heart disease. Uh, and that is important even if we have a dog that doesn't show any sign of cardiomegaly, because we definitely see where the turbulent blood flow arises. Um, and if there is a uh, you know, structural abnormality that we can pick up on echo, um, that will help us determine if the patient needs treatment. And um, the, the, the other thing that echo can do is, you know, if we have a, 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 a symptomatic patient, the diagnosis of CHF based solely on echo can be more challenging, but we always have to remind ourselves that we have clinical information that we always have to, you know, um, combine with this test. Uh, uh, moreover, if we have B lines, effusions, pericardial B lines, or more specific echo parameters like, you know, um, that will indicate that there is a high uh, left ventricular filling pressures, for example, all of these build up towards the diagnosis of CHF. However, it may be more challenging sometimes um, to rely on echo alone. In this situation, in this scenario, other tests may be needed. Uh, but in general, the echo um, can be, um, you know, the most informative test that we can offer and provide after we hear a heart murmur. What can we tell about biomarkers? Well, they are uh, indeed a, a good first step, first screening test after we hear heart murmur. It doesn't provide a final diagnosis because what we are assessing or measuring is LV wall stress for anti BMP or acute myocardial damage for troponin I. Um, and so you're not getting a final diagnosis. You are getting, is it cardiac or not? Um, and that can help, um, you know, targeting treatment for example you have a dyspneic patient that is not safe to you know take radiographs on uh, but you just uh, draw some blood and do you know some some screening tests then that can help us saying okay is it cardiac is it not or is it is it likely to be cardiac rather than uh, you know respiratory um, there are some studies uh, looking at monitoring the patient that can help us in terms of, okay, what are the chances that this dog that I've already seen with a heart murmur and a possible diagnosis is going to be into congestive heart failure in the short or medium term. And there are some studies showing that, you know, you can uh, use anti p values to, you know, uh, decide how often or frequent you want to see the patient. There are some confounders, as with every diagnostic test, which is azotemia and thyroid function uh, in, uh, in probably both of these tests, but also exercise and brain variability are important things to consider when we consider anti bmp testing. Um, so it is a good screening test. It doesn't provide us with a final diagnosis, but you know it, it's still a good way to go if we don't have echo available um, in the immediate term or if there are some cost concerns about you know doing a full echo. So I've decided to provide you with a little bit of a clinical case scenarios that we can discuss, okay, what would you do after you hear a murmur? And I hope you will enjoy that as well because it's a bit more practical. So if we have, a, let's say, a young dog, a puppy that comes to us, we hear a murmur, there is a regular rhythm, then our differentials are probably a congenital heart disease or an innocent murmur. We don't want this you know, young puppy dog to have much regurgitation due to degenerative mitral disease. It's very unlikely. So unless you hear you know, the typical early systolic, gratuito 6, uh, left apical murmur, and you're very and strongly convinced that is the case, 
um, probably test additional testing is advised and recommended because then you can you know if it's an innocent murmur forget about it until you hear a different murmur in the future or if it's something that is worth you know discussing and considering and knowing about then you've already you have already reached your diagnosis and for these reasons i think echocardiography would be the ideal best step in this scenario because you get the diagnosis you really you rule out heart disease and that's it you know that and you can you know go on and consider for example neutering if it's needed or uh, you know additional life expectancy discussion with a client can be done with more uh, you know tranquility and you know you you know what's going on if you can't because for whichever reasons then probably if you are looking for congenital heart disease um, you may see something on radiographs. So thoracic radiographs and a combination of thoracic radiographs and anti-PROMMP can probably help you tailoring a little bit more uh, the next, you know, um, steps and management options in these patients. Let's say uh, instead we have an asymptomatic small medium breed dog that has a soft murmur and a regular rhythm. Uh, if it's an adult dog, then it could be a degenerative mitral valve disease or valvular disease, an undiagnosed congenital heart disease that, you know, uh, this dog has grown, uh, you know, has grown with it, uh, or an innocent murmur still. And it's unlikely to be associated with marked cardiac remodeling because the murmur is soft. However, we would probably need to make sure that is the case. And therefore, I think thoracic radiographs can be considered because then we can already identify if cardiomegaly is present. Um, and if there is cardiomegaly and the clients are up, for it, are up for it, then you can do an echocardiogram. You know, you can potentially offer an echocardiogram straight away. It's not wrong. Um, but if funds are limited or the clients are not really keen on that, then you can start with thoracic radiographs. Let's say you have the same dog, but with a loud or a thrilling murmur, um, then it's more likely to be a degenerative valvular disease or an undiagnosed congenital heart disease. It's not going to be an innocent murmur. And as such, we probably will need to know if cardiac remodeling is present, you know, warranting treatment. Um, and again, probably thoracic radiographs could be a good first initial step to investigate these murmur farther. If the clients can, then an echocardiogram would probably be very informative. And if we find cardiomegaly, again, that would be probably strongly uh, recommended to do an echocardiogram. We can consider anti pro -BMP. However, remember that you can't get a diagnosis, a final diagnosis. You can have a presumed diagnosis, which is, you know, probably fair enough in some scenarios. But uh, a high anti pro -BMP can indicate that the patient is at risk of congestive heart failure in the um, medium term, short medium term. And they found mo more than one study found that uh, greater than 1500 pike moles per liters indicates an increased risk of congestive heart failure um, in dogs with genetic valvular disease. So I think that is something important that you can consider. So you can decide, okay, so if the likelihood is, you know, a dog with a genetic valvular disease with echocardiographic radiographic signs, sorry, radiographic signs of congestive heart failure. Um, of cardiomegaly, um, I can run anti pro and see if it's very high, then this patient is at risk of developing congestive heart failure in the future. If we have a large breed dog with a soft murmur, probably the first differential is a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype. But then large breed dogs can too have degenerative valvular disease and can too have innocent murmurs. So um, in this scenario, thoracic radiographs can help if there is cardiomegaly, but if there isn't, uh, then you know, you're stuck with what is going on. Do I need to do anything? And that is important when we consider dilated cardiomyopathy because they may not show radiographic signs. And in this scenario, an echocardiogram would be a good option to offer because then we can already see pretty frankly, if there is systolic dysfunction requiring early treatment. Anti-proven P can also be considered 
but we don't have treatment recommendation available based solely on biomarkers. So we can't say, you know, anti prbmp of X is going to, to, you know, you have to start treatment. So that is the limiting factor. If we think about a geriatric dog, that is a small breed um, with a lot of thrilling murmur and a regular rhythm, an irregular rhythm, then we need to think about two problems, you know, two things that we want to investigate further, the murmur and the irregular rhythm. And differentials are probably the same as before. Um, and cardiac remodeling is likely to be present if we think about an irregular rhythm. There is something that is pushing, you know, our heart um, to, you know, to a point of um, extra strain. So we probably need thoracic radiographs. We probably need an echocardiogram and we can decide whether there is cardiomegaly and we want to push for an echo. And then we need an ECG because we need to characterize this arrhythmia. Is it atrial? Is it ventricular? Etc. Etc. A large breed dog that has a soft murmur and an irregular rhythm can be another scenario where you are left with probably this dog has a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype or degenerative valvular disease, but also an innocent murmur and associated low nature fibrillation, for example. And, for, and so because of that, you need probably an ECG to check for the arrhythmia. Um, and an echo is probably the best diagnostic steps because of the limitations that we've already discussed about uh, cardiomegaly in you know large breed dogs that may have a preclinical DCM. But you can do them, of course, if you want to screen. Um, just do not expect you know so much information in most of the times. Let's move on to cats. So we have a young cat with a soft murmur and a regular rhythm. Uh, it's probably um, it's likely that we are dealing either with an instant murmur or um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a congenital heart disease. But if it's a very young cat, we hope it's not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, do we? Um, anti probmp can be used um, for screening to say, okay, is it cardiac, is it not? Or better say, how likely is this murmur to cause uh, alveolar stress? But again, probably an echo is the most informative test that we should probably be offering to these uh, clients because we have a final diagnosis again. If we have an adult cat with a moderate to loud murmur, the typical, you know, in between murmurs and a regular rhythm, it's probably likely to be either to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or another type of cardiomyopathy and or or <laughs> more than and or an innocent murmur. We can consider anti bmp because that can tell us uh, about um, underlying cardiomyopathy greater than 100 picomoles per liters uh, but the echo again will tell us for sure whether there is you know abnormal thickening of the LV walls um, which anti bmp cannot tell us uh, and probably BP measurement is recommended because we're dealing with an adult cat and you know maybe we have concurrent comorbidities that we need to rule out um, when we have an adult dog that has a moderate to loud murmur and a regular rhythm, but is tachypneic, so it's showing clinical signs that we are concerned about, um, the two questions we have is, is the murmur associated with heart disease? Which one? And is the tachypnea cardiac or non-cardiac? So we have two questions to uh, answer. And probably we thoracic radiographs in this scenario, if the patient is stable enough to tolerate lateral recumbency, those are very important because then we can definitely have a, a diagnosis of CHF or not um, and see if there is cardiomegaly, which generally come, goes along very well with, uh, you know, clinical signs. And when the patient is stable, we can do an echo, a full echo, to determine what's the underlying structural heart disease. Um, and you can do focused ultrasound um, in the meantime, just to see, you know, is the LAO big? How is the contractility? And that is already all you need to do if you start treatment in the acute phase. Antiprobimpy can be considered 
Um, however, remember that you may have some delays in getting the results, so it can help, but then it's not a final diagnosis, but it can tell you, is it cardiac, is it not? And therefore, you know, move on to the next treatment options or the best treatment options at that phase. If we have an adult cat with a moderate to loud murmur, uh, that is tachypneic, we have the same questions. Is the murmur, car, uh, you know, associated with, um, you know, structural heart disease? And is it tachypnea? because of congestive heart failure, or is it because of other disease conditions, respiratory, systemic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and anti-proBNP in these scenarios, the, the, the SNAP anti-proBNP has been used to test um, cardiac versus non-cardiac cause of dyspnea uh, in, on blood, but also on effusions, if you have some. And if the patient is stable, you can do thoracic radiographs, um, make sure there is no bit pleural effusion because then you would need to drain that effusion first so that is absolutely a treatment and um, you know it will ease the patient's breathing very quickly stabilize the patient much better than you know um, doing additional tests before and the echocardiogram um, can be performed again when the patient is more stable um, and then remember that we are talking about a murmur, but we also have a tachypneic patient and, you know, a, a fast heart rate, a gallop rhythm. All these things can point towards the direction of the cat being uh, affected by congestive heart failure. And that is that could be the reason why the cat is tachypneic. So um, it's always, you know, um, um, putting all your clinical information and your diagnostics together to work out what's the best options in these patients. So I hope you enjoyed this um, little seminar. I had to be very quick on some uh, topics, but I hope you've enjoyed it and you've taken home some uh, uh, interesting messages and I'm ready and here and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this little seminar. And I see that there are already um, a few questions that you've already asked. Um, so I'm ready to answer these, but please feel free to um, add additional questions should, should you have any more. Um, so let's start with the questions that we've, we've already received. Um, the first one is uh, very interesting because I didn't touch that topic uh, during the presentation, but it is indeed one of those cardiac diseases that in some areas of the world, it's causing problem. So um, the identification of diaphragmitis, so heartworm, uh, via ultrasound. So let's start a little bit backward. Indeed, when we have heartworm um, infestation in the heart, we can see pulmonary hypertension because of this, um, you know, big um, uh, intruder into our pulmonary arteries. Uh, and that can cause um, vascular remodeling and therefore cause pulmonary hypertension. And therefore we can hear a murmur in these patients. It's generally a right-sided murmur uh, associated with uh, tricuspid regurgitation, which is most of the time associated with pulmonary hypertension. However, it's not always the case. So um, sometimes you can find heartworm in the pulmonary arteries as an incidental findings because we are doing you're doing a scan of a you know a degenerative mitral valve disease dog. So um, keep that option open. But um, and indeed, if there is pulmonary hypertension from your physical examination, thoracic radiograph, if you see a pulmonary arterial bulge or a vascular pattern, um, then you may find some diaphragmaria uh, in the heart as well. Uh, remember that size of the patient is important because um, if we have a large breed dog, it, it needs to be highly, um, unfortunately, um, infested and um, in, infected with, heart, with adult heartworms for you to be able to see them um, at the pulmonary artery um, uh, bifurcation near the heart. 
Uh, if you have a small breed dog, it's more likely because of sizing that you, you need less heartworms to find them. But they have that typical uh, double railway sign um, or equal sign, depending on how you, you um, translate that, um, that is floating inside your right pulmonary artery or left pulmonary artery. If you're really lucky and the dog has Pieville syndrome, I'm not going to delve too much into that, but if you have heartworms in the heart, you will see them again, floating in and out, right atrium, right ventricle, moving along. And that is indeed one of those things worth considering if you're living in, a, in an endemic region or the dog has traveled to an endemic region. Um, so, other questions um, that we've received are, what sedation protocols do we use for performing echo infectious patients? And I think that is a very um, nice question because you know not all our patients are compliant, not even to the point of auscultation. Um, and I think nowadays we have a, a good um, a variety of choices. If we know the dog, the dog or the cat is already fractious, or is really stressed because most of these dogs and cats, they just don't like to be being held or you know, going at the vet, which is fair enough. We need to, and we know that in advance, we could consider pre-medication at home with um, oral trazodone or gabapentin for cats. Um, trazodone uh, in dogs, the, the dose range is variable, but you can start giving it the night before and then the day before, two hours before traveling to the vet to do the echo. Um, and it works very nicely. There's, there are no cardiovascular uh, side effects. And most of the times, basically, you don't have any changes in systolic function or chamber size, which is great because then you can assess your heart um, with good, um, uh, you know, uh, without those confounding effects that you can sometimes see with other sedations. Um, and CATS works the same. So you can give trazodone the night before, or gabapentin for two, three days before, and you just give it, I mean, gabapentin, you could content, con give it the same as trazodone the night, the day before, and then the day prior to traveling. If you already know the patient is anxious and uh, stressed at the vet, because it will take that edge off and the patient can be, you know, slightly more uh, approachable. Um, if you don't know that, or if you prefer some, um, you know, drugs per need, uh, you can consider butorphanol, 0.2 to 0.4 mix per kick, um, IM or IV, if they allow you to get an IV catheter. Butorphanol is one of those drugs that works magnificently in some patients, and it doesn't work on others, and you don't know until you try. Um, so um, you can consider topping up butorphanol with other drugs. Um, you can use, you know, um, benzodiazepines, but um, I personally prefer to go bitorphanol and then uh, go with alfaxalone uh, to need per need. Um, um, be careful because then sometimes you can, uh, if it's a big dog, you have to inject a, a large volume and therefore um, it's better to have an IV catheter. Let's say you try bitorphanol, bitorphanol works halfway. Um, you can get an IV catheter in and then give all faxon to the need. Sometimes 0.5 mix per kick would work, but you can go per need. But be careful because all faxon can induce, you know, general anesthetic. It's an anesthetic agent. Therefore, you need to monitor, um, you know, heart rate, um, pulse ox, pulse ox um, and if needed, you need to intubate the patient. You don't, you generally don't need to reach that point of sedation um, to to have you know, decent echo images. So I would try to go on the, you know, quiet, but not fully sedated patient, if that makes sense. Um, but indeed is, is one of those, this is one of those situations where you need, you know, some help. Um, and all these drugs, they don't tend to have a marked effect on cardiovascular um, dynamics, or hemodynamics and systolic function. So that's, that's pretty nice. Um, so then we have other questions that are more about approaching, um, you know, auscultation and murmurs, etc. So let's see um, if um, I can help on that. Um, so one of the questions is, if you detect a heart murmur on auscultation and you suspect most of the times mitral valve disease, 
do we need to start treatment or not? Wait for the echo. So I, I hope I gave you a little bit of information with the clinical scenarios. Um, I, I feel that it's always difficult to rely only on one technique. You know, it, is it auscultation or radiographs or anti pervian or an echo? I think most of the time, if we have a heart murmur and we have an echo, I think I feel comfortable in saying, okay, do we need to start treatment? Yes, we have objective measures. Um, if we can do an echo straight away and we have a murmur that is very soft, as we were saying, like less than you know three out of six. So if it's a two out of six, I wouldn't even consider suggesting treatment because it's very unlikely, if not nearly impossible, uh, but we never know, uh, to need treatment. Okay. So if we have a louder murmur and we can't access the echo straight away, I would probably consider radiographs or anti P. Um, there was a study that is very interesting to look at from Jenny Will Show, the Hamlet study, that tried to um, divide B1 from B2 patients you know, from the general, you know, from a general practice point of view without an echo. But those dogs had an echo that allowed for you know, the final diagnosis. And antipermin P could help discriminate more or less between B1 and B2, like less than 700, it's more likely to be B1. But again, I think it is difficult to rely on you know, that because we don't, we are lacking the information about, you know, is this dog exercising a lot? Is there any other breed predisposing factors, you know? So I wouldn't rely only on that. Um, and I wouldn't rely only on auscultation to start treatment. Uh, but indeed, we can go on um, to propose, if we can, additional diagnostics. Otherwise, I would probably wait um, because it's, you know, it's an expensive drug um, uh, if we need to start that. And it's probably a little bit of a shame to, you know, make these owners pay a decent amount of money monthly because it's not a one off. Um, and maybe they don't need that and you can invest those money for additional diagnostics. Yes, taking rest and respiratory rate is, a nice, and is another very important um, thing to suggest to clients. Um, mostly if you have, you know, this young, uh, not, sorry, not young, you know, those dogs with mitral valve disease and you suspect that they are already a B2. Um, what I find sometimes very difficult to talk to with clients is that they always think about the cough the cough is a big issue. And some people just forget about measuring resting respiratory rate. So they come to you saying, oh, you know, my dog is coughing a lot. And you ask them, so did you measure resting respiratory rate? Because that is the most important thing to in order to detect congestive heart failure. And they may, may or may not have measured that. And that is a very difficult um, discussion that sometimes you have with clients because it's, they, seem to be relying a lot more on the cough, which is again, not a specific test for congestive heart failure of, or left atrial or ventricular remodeling. Um, so another question that uh, we got is, uh, what is your approach when you hear a heart murmur during a puppy kitten checkup? I hope I have answered your questions um, with the clinical scenarios. Um, I would probably say, again, um, if you're comfortable, I mean, I think it always depends on the client's funds, um, which is, you know, one of the things we have to, you know, deal with every day. If the clients, you know, are available for an additional test, then I would probably recommend um, a, a scan, a heart scan, a, an echocardiogram, because that will tell us for sure is there or is there not, <laughs> there isn't, no? If there is um, some congenital heart disease or it is an innocent murmur. Another thing, another question that we received was, you know, how, until what age should you con be considering innocent murmurs? And I think that is one of those things that it is important to stress that most of the time, yes, we, we, we are led to believe that innocent murmurs do occur in young puppies but they do occur also in adult dogs. And you can tell for sure, unless you know we have some uh, auscultatory uh, hints that that is an innocent murmur, but you can't rely on age alone. So you may have you know, the typical whippet or greyhound, or even just a very fit dog 
that have, or even a boxer, and they do have congenital heart disease, and they may have an innocent murmur picked up at an adult age because it's an ejection murmur. So they have very strong left ventricles and they have this big ejection and that causes a turbulent blood flow, but that's not pathological. And you won't know, and I wouldn't rely only on, 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 on age. I think what is also concerning when you have a puppy with a murmur is that if you have a puppy with a thrilling murmur, or with a very loud murmur irradiating, then that is probably not 100% because we know 100% in veterinary science doesn't work, but 99% something else that is not innocent and needs to be investigated. So I would probably rely more on the characteristics of the murmur rather than the age uh, when we talk about innocent or pathological. Um, I think another question that comes into this um, topic is how often should we be routinely monitoring murmurs when the owners decline for the workup? Because you know that is also life. We have those cases. Um, I would probably recommend if it's a young dog, let's say less than two, I would probably ask to take this dog every three months just to make sure that there is no additional clinical signs associated with a murmur. If it's an adult dog, probably three to six months. Um, and I will probably try to make clear to the client that they should be monitoring exercise levels, uh, activity, resting respiratory rate, even if it's an overkill, but probably if they won't go for further testing uh, at that stage, I will probably try to you know, inform them that there are also other things they should be picking up um, and refer and seek veterinary advice earlier if possible. Um, there is another question about how good are the uh, ProBMP in-house test, um, and I think there is it is worth um, discussing a little bit this because um, cats and dogs are a bit different. Um, generally speaking, when we talk when we think and talk about dogs, a qualitative assay is the gold standard if we think about chiral biomarkers. So we need a quantitative rather than qualitative assessment. I don't think there is any uh, good qualitative test in terms, is it high or low? I think we need numbers. Um, and in cats, the, the SNAP is very helpful because it was set up of 100 picomoles per liter. And we know that uh, most cats with congestive heart failure and heart disease have a high uh, anti per BMP. Uh, however, um, the, the um, quantification of anti BMP in cats doesn't work that nicely as it does in dogs. Um, so we, we may have a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, and an asymptomatic patient, so maybe even with a small left atrium, that may end up having very high anti BMP levels, like greater than 1,500, and people will freak out because, of course, it's like, oh my God, what's going on? And that there is, there is, we are talking about a clinical patient. So, I, in cats, what is important to remember is if you have a murmur and there is possibly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the qualitative testing, um, the degree of elevation doesn't tell you the severity of the disease. It's very important. If we have a SNAP test, which and the cutoff is 100. It is very helpful if you have CHF. So you're like, okay, so is this cat uh, distinct because of heart disease or not? Uh, it, tell, it helps us selecting our population rather than relying on the value. And that's why qualitative testing in cats works nicely. Quantitative testing in cats doesn't work as nicely. And in dogs, it's probably the other way around, rather, or better say, we don't use qualitative testing in dogs, we use quantitative testing. And that's why um, there are some limitations if you have a very distinct patient to do anti MP and submitting it, unless you have you know, a machine that can measure that straight away. Um, so I hope that that helps <laughs> in, in terms of you know, uh, setting the expectations um, for these tests. Um, Cat heart murmurs are very, very um, interesting and another level of life, but um, I wouldn't rely 
strongly on the murmur characterization for innocent murmurs in cats, because cats can do whatever they want, can they? Um, and I think um, I would still strongly recommend an echo if you suspect, even if you suspect an innocent murmur in cats, because we, we, we can't rely fully on, you know, ask, murmur auscultation characteristics for innocent murmurs in cats. It tends to be again like if it if it goes and uh, if it if it there if it's there on one auscultation and it's gone on another, if it's a soft murmur, it could be innocent. Again, if we have a very loud murmur greater than four out of six with a thrill, it's not going to be an innocent murmur, even in cats. But cats are you know are a bit more aliens than dogs, and they like to mix up a little bit of place. And doesn't don't they don't allow us to be that streamlined as we could be with dogs, um, and cats can have heart disease even without a heart murmur, which is even more confounding, isn't it? But I hope I've helped a little bit on this topic, um, and I think uh, I think I've already discussed a little bit the um, when should you investigate puppy murmurs. I hope that was um, helpful. What I've already discussed, um, and um the week uh, was already discussed and i think what we're left with another question um, um which is can we have an idea of the stage of vascular disease according to the direction of the jet flow into the atrium and i think we with that we open up pandora box because um there are many things that we can discuss um i think the short answer is not much um because you can use the uh, uh, jet area ratio just to get an idea if you have a small jet then it's more likely to be you know an hemodynamically insignificant murmur uh, but there are many other things to consider I'm not sure we have enough time to delve into this um, but generally speaking if you have a big jet of regurgitation it's more likely to be significant but there are many other ways that you can tell is it significant and I would probably rely on left tissue size left ventricular size rather than relying only on the jet that you see. Um, because there are some technical issues, you may not be very well aligned, you may have Doppler issues with the setting, uh, it may look, be, look bigger or even smaller, uh, depending on your setting. So I wouldn't rely only on that, I would rely on, is this regurgitation causing remodeling? And therefore, is it significant? Um, and then, you know, there are more specific, refined quantification of murmur uh, of mitral regurgitation um, topics and, and, and things that we can do, but I'm, I think it's beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, so let me see if there are any other questions. And um, in the meantime, uh, okay. Um, so um, there is another question about um, the anti-pro BMP in a cat presenting with a murmur or tachypnic um, and the in-house snap. I think that is actually the situation where I would rely heavily on that if you don't have a scan available. Um, because um, the um, in-house snap um, cutoff is 100 picomoles per liters. And we know from previous studies that uh, cats with heart disease, most of them, <laughs> tend to have an uh, uh, anti pro BMP value greater than 100 picomoles per liter. You may have some false negatives as always, but it's um, generally very, very accurate in terms of bring in heart disease. So if you have a tachypneic patient um, and you run on an in-house SNAP, it, it's likely to tell you, okay, there is significant heart disease, you know, enough. It, there is heart disease. And therefore, the clinical signs are likely to be related with heart murmurs. There are always those odd cases where they have heart disease and they also have ongoing other respiratory issues, um, but that is probably uh, less the norm. Um, so I hope I, I've, I've answered that question, but um, let me know if you need more details on that. But indeed, that situation is the most important, informative. I think what is also very helpful in cats, if you have you know, cats with pleural effusions and you want to rule out heart disease, you can literally take the effusion and test that with an in-house snap. 
because that has been also validated and, uh, and that correlates very well with heart disease and congestive heart failure. And you do the same thing, you know, you AE is the patient's breathing, you remove, you do thoracosynthesis, you aid the cat in breathing better, you get your diagnosis, you start your treatment, which is great. Um, and I think, I think uh, there is another question about a possible uh, topic for uh, a webinar. So um, um, we will be working on that as well. So I think there, there, is, there is everything, I, I covered everything. Uh, rest and respiratory rate, I think I've already discussed that um, a little bit because I saw it popping out. Um, but I think that is very important. And I think, unfortunately, and I don't know why, clients do struggle sometimes a bit with measuring rest and respiratory rate at home. They do focus more on the coughing, which is, I understand, it's probably more concerning from an everyday day-to-day -day -day basis because you have your dog, you're sleeping, and your dog is coughing. But that is not a marker of congestive heart failure and you know it's difficult when they come to you saying the dog is coughing and you don't know what's the rest in respiratory rate at home um yes so i'm not sure amelia if you want to um pop by and say anything else but i think um these were all the questions and i hope you've enjoyed it and it's and i hope it's useful for you know your everyday practice